Could the Tour de France be won on mid-level components? Normally, the winner of the Tour de France uses a top-spec bike that costs over 10K. But what if the best rider used an enthusiast-level bike that costs a third of the price? Could they still win? Is it all about the bike? To find out, we're going to do some tests with two-time Tour de France winner Tadej Pogacar. Yeah, he should be here any minute. Oh. Yo, Pogster. How's it going? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, mate, yeah. What do you mean you can't come? What do you mean there's, big, there's a big bike ride happening in France? <sighs> Unfortunately, Pog can't make it. But don't worry, we've got the next best thing, GCN's very own Stig, Andrew Feather, who, as luck would have it, is actually the same weight and height as Pogaccia and is able to ride at the same power and intensity as a Tour de France champion. Which on an epic mountain climb like Alpe d'Huez is typically 6 to 6.5 watts per kilogram of body weight. And this is sustained for 30 to 40 minutes. It's absolutely huge. If you don't believe me, well, weigh yourself and try it in your local gym. If you can last three minutes at that intensity, you're doing well. What, what power are you going to have to produce to do that? Around 430. 430 watts. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the budget for this particular video to go to the real Alpe d'Huez. But once again, we've got the next best thing. Ralph Allen Drive in Bath. For those of you unfamiliar with Ralph Allen Drive, it's 1.2 kilometers long with an average gradient of 9%. And this is key because the real Alpe d'Huez is 12 kilometers long with an average gradient of 8.6%. So very similar. Now, of course, if you'd like us to go and repeat this experiment or something similar in the real Alpe d'Huez, well, you can help support the channel by liking and subscribing. Now our test is simple. Feather is going to ride his top of the range bike up Ralph Allen Drive at six watts per kilo. He's then going to repeat the test on the mid-spec bike riding at the same power intensity and then we're going to see what the time difference is. We can also extrapolate the time by timesing it by 10 to get an idea of what this would equate to on the 12 kilometer Alpe d'Huez. Oh and bonus fact for you, Feather actually has the 13th quickest time of all time on Alpe d'Huez. Time for run one. Feather, are you ready? I'm ready. This is on the lightweight, top spec bike. Can I give you some beeps? I'm not, I'm just gonna count. Three, two, one, on you go. While Feather smashes up the climb, I can tell you that in its current configuration, his bike weighs 6.4 kilograms. So I've added 400 grams of additional ballast to take it up to the 6.8 kilogram UCI limit, which is what Pogacar's and other top tour contenders bikes typically weigh. He's using top end components, although admittedly his bike setup isn't quite the same as a lot of top Tour de France contenders, but sourcing exact components and bikes isn't as straightforward as you'd think at the moment. Time for run two, mid-spec bike. You ready? I'm ready, yep. Right, I'll count you in when the cars have gone past. Three, two, one, go. Hold your horses, keyboard warriors. I know what you're saying. That's an Orbea Orca Aero. How on earth can you call that mid-range? 
Well, that's a good question. A bike like this is still expensive, but although the frame shape with all the aerodynamic tech is the same as the top of the range ones, manufacturers like Orbea can create more affordable models by using different carbon fiber and then specking lower level components. So fitted with Shimano 105, it's more representative of a keen enthusiast's bike and costs around a third of the price of a Tour de France bike. Although aero with the 105, it weighs 8.2 kilograms. And the keen-eyed among you may notice it's not got a 105 chain set. Well, the reason is Alex forgot to charge the battery for the power meter, so we rummaged in the back of the GCN cupboard and found this old Dura Ace one. If you're wondering, it weighs around 100 grams less than the 105 one, so we added that weight back to the bike via some water in the bottle. You may ask, why haven't we gone for something lower spec, like Sora or something more entry level like the Eurobike. Well, my suspicion is that the gap in performance would be too big, but if this video gets 10,000 likes, then it's a subject we'll happily revisit in the future. Cheers to doing that feather. Sterling job as usual. How was it? It's fine. Yeah. Okay, you can go now. You can have my lessons. Oh yeah, as promised, here's your lettuce. Cheers. Don't eat it all at once though. We need to keep you nice and lean. Okay, all right, that's, that's lunch. Right, we're gonna go uh, back to GCN Megabase to have a look at the results and see what they mean. Can we have a, um, a retro Batman style scene transition, please? I've got the results and they're really interesting, but before I reveal them, a little bit of context. So this test is focusing on climbing because in the case of the yellow jersey, it's on climbs where the race is more often than not decided and won or lost. And the biggest difference between mid-level and top-level components is weight, which matters most on a climb. There are differences in shifting quality and drivetrain efficiency, but this is very small and largely insignificant. Large sections of the race involve riding on the flat and descending. And in these parts of the race, weight isn't especially important. Aerodynamics is far more important, but the aerodynamic difference between top end components and mid-level ones is absolutely minimal. And a mid-level aero frame set, although heavier, is gonna be faster on the flat than a top end lightweight one. Similarly, when descending, the mid-level brakes lack the refinement of the top-end ones, but they still work really well. And I think it's safe to make the assumption that the difference isn't enough that they would determine the outcome of the race. So on to the results. And on our 1.2 kilometer segment on Ralph Allen Drive, Feather averaged 437 watts on his superbike and 436 watts on the mid-level components. So the two runs, they were within one watt of each other, which is kind of as close as you'd get. So what was the time difference? Drum roll. Well, it was less than three seconds, which blows my mind. Now, if we scale that up and take it to the 12 kilometers of Alpe d'Huez, it equates to roughly 28 to 30 seconds difference, which is quite a bit. Now, if we put that into the context of the biggest Tour winning margins in history, you have to look at the recent Tour de France because back in the day, the Tour was won by hours. Uh, but in the modern era, Jan Ulrich won the Tour in 97 by nine minutes and nine seconds. That's a big margin. And then more recently in 2014, Vincenzo Nibali won the Tour by seven minutes and 27 seconds. Also a big margin. So winning margins like that suggest that even if the winner of that year's race lost 30 seconds on five summit finishes, they'd still come out on top and be able to win. But you've got to remember, there's lots more mountains they have to go up in the race, not just summit finishes where they'd presumably lose time as well. And therefore it would add up significantly over the course of three weeks. So while the difference in mid-level and top-level components appears to be relatively small when taken on a single climb in isolation, when you add it up over a three-week race, this simple test suggests that it would be hugely significant for a Tour de France contender. And so I'm going to stick my neck out and say that in the modern era, unless someone's winning the Tour by half an hour, that yeah, I think uh, it wouldn't be possible to win the Tour on mid-level components. I'm, I'm going there. I'm saying it. But let us know your thoughts and comments uh, down below. And if you've enjoyed this video, 
give it a thumbs up and uh, let us know what you'd like us to do in the future. What else would you like to see us test?